Hi. One of the questions that people going through a leadership development journey often ask is what should I do if even after doing everything I possibly can, I still don't achieve my goal? We're going to explore that question by doing an exercise. In this exercise, I'd like you to write a story from your life where you didn't get an outcome you wanted, but you really feel like you did everything you could. Let's look at an example of a story like that to give you a sense of what that story might look like. Okay, here's my helpless story. In 2015, I wanted to create a way to deliver online content to participants of our program so that we could create more sustainability and follow-up. Okay? So we asked the firm that had designed our website if they would be able to design it, and they said they would. But even though I showed them very clearly what I was looking for the learning management system to do, they kept making mistakes. They never used to test the software, so every time they presented me a version and I tried it out, it would fail. I wasn't sure what to do. I felt like we'd already paid so much money to them and invested so much time that I should stick with them and give them some extra time to solve the issue rather than starting from scratch. But this kept stretching and in the end, after two years, I finally gave up on them. I didn't even have a really stable login page. It was completely unusable for use with clients. I decided not to sue them to get the money back because I thought it's just gonna tie us down in useless legal cases. And then I left the idea on the table for a couple of years and then finally we decided that we would develop that learning management web design capabilities in-house. It took nearly a year for us to get our new hire Vishal to get to grips with what the web designers had done. And just then, the coronavirus hit India in 2020. None of us could do any in-person workshops for months and there was a huge potential demand for online programs. If our vendor had actually done the work, then we would have been completely unaffected, but instead we lost about $70,000 of revenue in just one week of cancellations. And every time I think of it, it makes me feel, ugh, that's my helpless story. Okay, now it's your turn to write a story from your life. There are three rules to this exercise. One, the aim is to convince someone who might read the story that there really was nothing else you could have done. Two, the facts of the story have to be true. So this is not a made up story like aliens came and kidnapped me. It's a real story, it can be personal or professional. If you pick something that still bugs you today, you'll get more value from the exercise. Three, you don't have to believe that there was nothing else you could have done. You might feel like you could have, but you want to write it in a way that somebody reading it would be convinced that there really was nothing you could have done. But the facts have to be true. So why don't you pause the video here so you can write the story. You'll get more value from the exercise if you do. I'm gonna assume you wrote the story. Now there are many different ways of telling a story. Two distinct ways of telling a story are what we call the helpless story and the ownership story. The story you just heard was the helpless story. The bottom line of the helpless story is that there is nothing I can do. Or if it's a story about the past, the bottom line is there's nothing I could have done. There are usually three things we blame when we tell a helpless story. Either we blame other people, he doesn't listen to me, she betrayed me, they don't give me what I want. Or we blame the situation. It was quarter ending, there was no network, there was a terrible traffic jam. Or we blame ourselves. I can't say no to people. I don't have the discipline to exercise. I can't help losing my temper. But whoever you blame, you lose power. If you blame other people, you feel anger, resentment, betrayal. If you blame the situation, you feel powerless, helpless, fatalistic. And if you blame yourself, you feel guilt, shame, low self-worth. You lose your power whenever you say there is nothing you can do. So what's the alternative? The alternative is the ownership story. You look at your choices of actions and interpretations that contributed to the outcome, but without blaming yourself. A lot of us don't understand ownership. We think taking ownership means blaming ourselves. And this is what I used to think. I thought that if I hadn't achieved my target, then either I blame someone or something else, and if there's nobody else to blame, then I take responsibility and admit it's my fault. So if my boss asked me, have you achieved the target? I would say, I don't wanna make excuses. It's my fault for not achieving the target. It's completely my mistake. 
And I thought she would say, okay, she's taking responsibility. She's understood her mistake. So she wouldn't say anything to me, but she wasn't buying it. She would say, Amantika, I don't care if it's your fault. I don't care if it's the other manager's fault. I don't even care if it's my fault. What I want to know is, what do we need to do? When I was growing up, my teacher would say, who is responsible for this? And so my understanding of responsibility was, who is the bad person who has done this terrible thing? My boss's definition of responsibility was completely different. It was response, ability. How are we going to respond to this? What are we going to do? It wasn't even about what we should have done or could have done, because that would still be saying that we should have had the learning even before the event that led to that learning. That's impossible. It was always about what are we going to do to fix this? What is our learning? What are we going to do differently next time? Not what we should have done, no guilt. What we will do differently next time, that's clarity. Telling the ownership story has nothing to do with blaming yourself. It's about reclaiming your personal power. So imagine you're driving a car and you get lost. You could blame other people. You didn't explain the instructions properly. Why did my friend pick a house in such a random location? You could blame the situation. The signposts weren't marked properly. The map is unclear. Or you could blame yourself. I'm useless at reading maps. I get us lost every time. Next time you read the map. But ownership is about simply saying, I took a left two kilometers back. I need to go back and take the right. That's it. No drama, no blame, just what's to be done. Let's look at the story you heard just now again, but this time, instead of the helpless story, let's hear the ownership story. Okay, here's my ownership story. In 2015, I wanted to create an online learning management system for Stillwater. There was a web design firm that had created our website, and since they had said they could design the LMS, I asked them to go ahead. I didn't invest any time in evaluating any other vendors because it felt like unnecessary admin work. I also didn't put in any legal clauses in our contract requiring successful completion of the work before we paid. Nor did I put in a time frame for completion. I just asked them if they could do it and how much it would cost. They said, yes, we can do it. And they gave me the cost and I said, fine. At the time, I thought it was fine to run a small firm purely on the basis of handshakes. But after two years, they still hadn't produced a working system and we lost a lot of money and more importantly, a lot of time. What I have learned from this is to take more time in evaluating multiple vendors to do a project rather than just pick one I have worked with before. What I have learned is that just because a vendor has successfully delivered on one project doesn't mean that they have the capability to deliver on a different type of project. What I have learned is that vendors may believe that they are capable of delivering on a project, but it's hard for them to have an objective self-assessment. And so I need to do more diligence to verify their capability. And I've learned that in order to make a strategic long-term initiative work, I need to devote more time to regular admin work like evaluating the capabilities of multiple vendors. And that means giving up some revenue from doing workshops today. What I realize about myself is that I gravitate towards work that I find interesting, like delivering workshops, but avoid work that I find more mundane. But evaluating different vendors, IT or accountants or travel agents is as critical a part of running a successful firm. And this work needs to be done as rigorously as we do our training workshops. That is my ownership story. All right, that's the ownership story. Now, what I'd like you to do is write the ownership version of your story. The same three rules apply. The aim is to write the story in a way that someone reading it would say, this time you've taken ownership. Two, the facts are true, it's the same story, and three, you don't have to believe that there was anything different you could have done, but you still want to write it in such a way that if someone was reading it, they would be convinced that you're focusing on your choices now without blaming yourself. After you have finished writing the story, please answer the following questions and we'll discuss them in more detail in our next video. What were the emotions you felt when you were telling the helpless story? What were the emotions you felt when you were telling the ownership story? Which one is more powerful? And what are the subconscious benefits we get from telling the helper story?